we are live. Welcome to 2011's Source Code Review and Thoughts film. I realize this video is long. If you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about, about the movies I watched. So I'm going to speak faster until my back gets better. So I start this video with a review, most likely with server spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will warn before I do so. And Hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the video with the rear itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the subject, including discussing the ending with no verbal warning. So, let's see. Yeah. Content warning and or trigger warning. I'm going to be discussing the potentially triggering content of this movie. And there's... Yeah, I basically do have to... That's going to require spoilers. So, brief spoilers for the movie. Torture, kidnapping, ableism, gaslighting, murder, and terrorism. No more spoilers for the time being. So, the movie is rated PG-13, and this video will be for those above that age. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So, feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie. In another tab, I will not mind. Now, I got this movie as a gift, so anything negative to say in this video is not out of bitterness. I also do not feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone working on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say, during this video, it's possible I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside. I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. So, I have watched this three times. The first viewing was in 2014, and it's actually, I have to admit, the first time I watched it, I wasn't sure that I was really going to, like, yeah, uh, I'm not sure that I would have guessed that I would be watching it even one more time, much less be making a video about it. And yeah, I, I showed it. You know, my father watched, my father and I watch movies together sometimes. He wanted to watch a movie with a time loop. This was, you know, I don't own a terrible. I, I like that kind of story, but I don't actually own that very many different movies with it. So yeah, I put this one on, figuring. You know, it's it's fine, and I I was struck by how good it was. I didn't really fully appreciate it the first time. So plot, present day America near Chicago. U.S. Army Captain Colton Stevens wakes up on a metro train. He's disoriented, trying to figure out how he got there from where he was, and then the train blows up, and then he wakes up. And the, yeah, not long after, he's he's back on the train eight minutes earlier. It, it starts the same way. The woman across from him says that she took his advice. It was good advice. And there are several other, like, things that will happen. Not, not a lot of reason for me to detail them, but just saying... He, you know, you can clearly tell. He, the character, and we, the audience, can clearly tell this is the same eight minutes. Like, some things might happen differently, but it's, it starts out the same. And he soon comes to realize he is in a seemingly unique position to save lives. He can repeat the same eight minutes on this metro train seemingly infinitely, and if he can help determine who bombed the metro train in the past, he can help authorities prevent the same bomber from carrying out another terrorist attack. So this is an act, according to him, to be an action drama, mystery, sci-fi thriller. And let's see. yeah, so it came out in 2011. It was directed by Duncan Jones off a Ben Ripley script. And yeah, the the concept is basically Stevens can go anywhere he wants on the train within these eight minutes. He can interact with anyone he wants any way he wants to. And I think it's worth noting that early on, Stevens essentially treats it like it's not real, not caring 
that he's upsetting these people, figuring, what does it matter? They'll be dead within eight minutes. But later on, he starts to empathize more with them and treat them more humanely. Now, I haven't seen this exact concept on the old. Obviously, there are other tense movies that involve time travel loops. They do a really good job in this movie of making it sufficiently interesting to see the same eight minutes over and over. And I should also say it's not... It's not literally that you see a full eight minutes, then another full eight minutes, then another full, you know, the, the, and, and, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just quote what they said in the commentary track. Each time the eight minutes start, Stevens enters it with a different mindset. So it's always different. It's never just the same. And the, the one across from him, Michelle Monaghan's Christina, you know, her, her behavior changes over the course of the film because it's always in reaction to Stevens. I would definitely say this movie was worth making. I honestly love most of this movie. I'll get into the exception to what, you know, the stuff I don't love later in this review. And, right, and on IMDb, the, the, there's only one tagline, and it's, make every second count. Actually, I don't, yeah, my, my DVD has a different one, so I'll, I don't know why that one's not on IMDb. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll add it myself. Change the past, save the future. Now, let's So, IMDb's More Like This list compares this to Edge of Tomorrow, which I give a 7 out of 10. Personally, I greatly prefer this movie to that one. One of my big issues with Edge of Tomorrow is that there isn't really much of a sense of danger. They could basically just do as many do-overs, take as much time to do them as they feel like. If you want to know more about how I feel that, about that movie, I did at least one video specifically on it. It's also compared to The Butterfly Effect, which I give an 8 out of 10. That one is a lot more personal of a story than this one is right from the start. You know, in that one, the protagonist has a stake in the time travel. Where here, you know, the, the stakes come over the course of the film. Very well done, stakes. And it's also been compared to The Machinist, which I give an 8 out of 10. I mean, that one's more psychological than this is. It's not about time travel. I'm not 100% certain why it's on the more like this list. Well, Nightcrawler, which I give an 8 out of 10. Okay, so this movie is clearly only on the list because both of them star Jake Gyllenhaal, but it's an excellent movie. You should definitely watch it. And I Am Legend, which I gave that a 7 out of 10. Wow, I must have been feeling very... Yeah, I'm not sure I would give it a 7 out of 10. It's probably more like a 5 out of 10. I mean, both of them are about a male star trying to solve a problem that could save lives. Other than that, they have very little in common. And Minority Report, which I give a 7 out of 10. Where this movie has loops, that one has precognition. And, you know, but, but both of them are about the protagonist trying to save lives. One major difference is that in that one, the protagonist is running for his life. You know, while also trying to save people. And I've seen some critics add that, you know, Groundhog Day, obviously, which I gave a 7 out of 10. That one is substantially funnier, but they do have a number of similarities. And... And Yeah, some critics have added Inception, which for me is a perfect 10 out of 10. The source code is nowhere near as complex as Inception. I guess I can see what they mean, since in both it's technically not reality that they're running around. You know, in... in yeah, actually, yeah, technically in both it's... Uh, well, yeah, in Inception it's 
someone's mind that they're inside of. In this, I suppose I shouldn't say exactly early on they talk about that it is basically in the mind of, you know, Stevens is experiencing the last eight minutes of Sean Fentress who died on the train. And some have compared this to the Mission Impossible movie, so so yeah, I'll just real quick go through. The first one is the seven out of ten, second one six out of ten, third seven out of ten, fourth seven out of ten, fifth is eight out of ten, sixth is a nine out of ten. I mean the major comparison being that it's a well trained operative trying to save lives. I'm not sure there's really much else on yeah. And some people have compared this to the adjustment bureau. I do still like the Adjustment Bureau better than this, but, you know, yeah, both of them have a love story in sci-fi, and this kind of, yeah, I think that is the thing. Now, the, the title refers to the program that allows going into someone's mind, and I've seen, I, I think it was Mar Marianne Johan. Hansen, who, who said that it's, you know, naming a program source code is like naming your dog, dog. And yeah, it kind of, I, I, I mean, they probably just thought source code would be a cool movie title. I wish that they had named the program something else and said, we're using the source code of, you know, I don't know, Lazarus, let's go with that, you know, because of uh, resurrection kind of thing, yeah. I would say the the director and the writer feel you know they're they're out to prove that you know I mean this was let's see this was the first I, I believe for for the actually oh that's right I did right, never mind I'll go off my notes. This is the second thing ever for director Duncan Jones, and it is the first movie that isn't a TV movie or direct-to-video for the writer. You know, prior to this, the poor guy was stuck writing direct-to-video species sequels. He wrote movies three and four in that series. This movie proves beyond a shadow of a doubt he can do so much more. And one of the reasons I decided to review this in addition to the cool sci-fi concept, I really appreciate the growth of Colton and the movie's heart. Which, you know, that's that's the thing with, with sci-fi. A number of the movies just get lost in cool ideas. And I get that. That's that's fun to do. But they forget to have a heart. And that that can work. Not every movie does need to have a heart, but it definitely makes the movie a lot better. I, I could understand people who say that the romance itself should not be in the movie, but the rest of the elements that give it a heart do definitely add to the movie. Now, the reason I own this, you know, this was given to me as a gift by a friend because I was discussing Edge of Tomorrow with, yeah, with a friend, and I told him I hadn't watched this movie or owned a copy of it yet, and yeah. And, let's see, yeah, so this is, you know, other, other than time travel loop, this is also the kind of story where, you know, that, that explores the idea of, of, you know, the one man who can stop a terrorist act, and, you know, in a number of those stories, post 9-11, civil rights are basically treated as an obstacle, as something that gets people killed because it just means you can't get the job done. And this movie kind of challenges that. Like, early on, Stevens does basically, and, and Christina calls him out for it. Like, very early on, he's like, is that the terrorist? And she's like, you're racially profiling him. You're literally racially profiling this guy. And yeah, the, you know, the movie calls him out for it, and I'm not going to give away exactly how he does end up catching the guy, or who it turns out to be, or, or anything, but the movie definitely does make the case that you should still 
hold on to your humanity and allow and, and you know treat others with humanity, not try to take away the humanity of other people, even if it is, you know, it might save lives. And so yeah. Like I mentioned, this was written by Ben Ripley. Not proud of it, but I have watched all four species movies, and this is infinitely better. And I do also think, like, the poor guy, by the time of the third movie, I mean, I mean, really, the fourth movie, the fourth movie is kind of off doing its own thing, but the third movie is following up the first two. And where the first movie came in and, like, hit the ground running and was like, okay, let's let's bring in a kind of neat sci-fi concept. Let's try to get some good actors. Let's, let's write it as intelligently as we can. Like, don't get me wrong, even the first Species movie is a B movie, but it, it shows that B movies don't have to be badly written. It is legitimately, like, yeah. But then the second one, the, the writing is heh, not not quite as good, which is too bad because the, the stakes are really like, yeah, the second one definitely raises the stakes very, very nicely. And by the time of the third one, like it had to craft another movie around the twists that had just, yeah, it's... I think Ben Ridley, ben, ben Ripley did as good a job as he could with Species 3 and 4. This gains a lot from the human story in there with our protagonist's insistence on being more than a tool and the studio enforced yet still sweet romance. Still, this isn't as clever as it thinks it is. It also doesn't realize all of the ethical issues the concept brings up in spite of trying to address the ones it can. The subtle exploration of post island thinking is one of the greatest strengths here. And I really appreciate that at the very start, like the, the, the first run through of the eight minutes, we see how it just plays out basically if nothing is changed. And that, you know, that gives us a frame of reference for later and it allows us to just focus, you know, and, and this actually... I wonder how, let's see, I don't remember the name, but let's see, if I recall correctly, the writer of Groundhog Day asked, I believe Harold Ramis was the one who directed it, so he asked the director of Groundhog Day, please keep intact that the movie starts in media res, that the movie starts with him already in the loop. And then the audience slowly realized, oh, he's in a loop. That's why he's, you know. And apparently, as far as I recall reading about it, like, the director was, you know, he felt bad about it. He felt like, but it's like, I, and, and I can see that. Like, back then, I don't, I think people would have, like, I think there's a chance some people would have walked out of the theater. Like, they would have just been, okay, I don't understand this movie. I don't, I'm done. I'm done with it. But this movie, you know, by, by 2011, we were ready for it. You know, the movie, you don't see exactly how, like, for a while, you don't know exactly how Stevens ended up in the situation he's in. And at first, they won't even explain anything to him, which really makes it very disorienting. But, yeah, like, from right away, he's in this loop. Now, quoting a fellow critic here, Director Duncan Jones faces a challenge. How to depict the same eight-minute time period a number of times without boring his audience? By varying pace and modifying character actions and reactions, he largely accomplishes this in much the same way that Harold Ramis did with Groundhog Day. Just that concept in itself has power. It's one thing to see people on a train, but see those people and know that you're witnessing the last minutes of their lives gives everything they do significance and poignancy. What's more, knowing that what you're seeing isn't even real, that this isn't time travel, but just waves of memory, creates a sympathetic awareness of the simplicity of human longing. 
and the on the commentary track they talk about that they thought it was very important to have humor in the movie and that it was important for Stevens to sort of believe in himself that the yeah now the concept of being able to redo the same segment of time repeatedly is a stretch but it makes for a very entertaining movie that is good most of the way yeah th this is a concept that needs some explaining before you're willing to accept it before you know again at at the very start you don't even completely understand what you're seeing you can tell that it's science fiction but you don't know exactly what the boundaries are. But the movie does a good job explaining, although some some have said, you know, yeah, the, the movie uses the word quantum and we're basically, it's just, it's, it's one of those science fiction movies where you probably shouldn't think too hard about the, the science of it. And the yeah the movies the movie has a mixed handling of plot twists. Some of them are definitely good, others are definitely bad. There aren't too many, and the ending twist is definitely bad. There aren't too few. Some people felt that it was too easy to figure out for the viewer. Actually, yeah to. to I don't, I don't think I ended up copying it into my my notes at all, but I, I read one review where the guy literally said, okay, I'm, I'm, yeah, I know I just said literally, I I'm, may have to paraphrase him, I don't remember the exact words, but he said, I and my girlfriend figured out who the bomber is, and the, the, I suppose I can't, yeah, if I say more, I'll give stuff away, but he, he figured out the various twists early while watching the movie, and yeah, I, I mean, it's one of those movies where, yeah, some, some people will be able to figure out the twists, and obviously it's frustrating while watching a you know, I don't like telling you, the dear viewer of this channel, hey, go watch this mystery movie, but try not to figure out the mystery yourself. That's, that, no, that's, that sucks. But, yeah, this, this is one of those movies where you might be able to figure out the, the twist. And I'm sorry, but the, if you do end up figuring out the twist before you see the reveal, it definitely won't have the same impact. Now, this definitely is a movie that makes me want to watch more by this director, writer, and stars. Now, the direction is quite focused by Duncan Jones. I haven't seen anything else he's made. I know, I know. I'm definitely going to watch Moulin. It sounds amazing. Yeah, he's most well known for Moon, for this, and Warcraft. Here's hoping the Rogue Trooper movie is... Like, if the Road Trooper movie is just, like, 30% as fun as the game is, I'm there. I'm definitely... I, I have to admit, I haven't read the comics, but... I I like comics. I might. If if the if that movie goes to theaters, not, like, Netflix or something, I think I might try to track down some of the comics and, and maybe even replay the game if my wrists are finally there by then. Anyway, I... For, for sure, I would say that Duncan Jones understood how to make the, the movie work. And the he was recommended for directing it by Jake Gyllenhaal, who had watched Moon. And the... But, but there is still... You know, you can clearly tell that Duncan Jones is passionate about really making the movie as good as possible. Now, the very first shot of the movie are these establishing shots. I guess it's... Is it of Chicago, or is that just where the train is headed? I'm not 100% certain, but yeah. And with ominous music playing over, so you, you get the sense that there's something, you know, dangerous. And 
the the first real scene is Stevens waking up on the train disoriented and it it does a good job of like I really appreciate that it I don't think the movie would have been as good if it had started with you getting very much information the the first maybe five or ten minutes there's a lot you don't know and it's it's very compelling trying to you know this is one of those things where you'll enjoy it more the the less you know about the movie going into it but which I realize you know seeing as I'm sitting here describing a lot of the movie but tell you what if you really if if by the end of this review of mine if you find you really want to watch the movie I guess just like you know note that you want to watch the movie and just, and wait until you've forgotten what I've said in the review it's, it's something like that I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending I will say it largely does fit with what came before the ending is my biggest problem with the movie. It, I, I guess it's really my, it's maybe my only real problem. With the movie. I, yeah, never mind. It's my biggest problem with the movie, by far the, the biggest. It arguably has Deus Ex Machina and other convenient writing. It does resolve everything and you understand why the ending happens the way it does and why it couldn't have happened sooner. Ultimately the solution has a number of problems. It feels so convenient and simple that I kept waiting for the twist to it and it's easy once we get there to the point where the audience wonders why it took so long to get there. While the ending does make sense it's rather sappy and we end up feeling more tricked than surprised. And Yeah, the ending titles, there's, you know, to an extent they kind of let you sit with the ending. And, yeah, it leaves you in the same emotional state as the ending. The movie doesn't really lose your interest along the way. The redoing of the same eight minutes repeatedly is used well. Since some of the characters have to be convincing as people who've been in the military for years, you know, yeah, the, the actors really did have to, to get that kind of stuff down. And they do a really good job. Like, there's fairly early on Jake Gyllenhaal, like, he's basically trying to analyze exactly how he is in the situation he's in. And... You know, he uses terminology and tries to just, yeah, it's it's very, you know, the, the I forget exactly who it, was it maybe the writer, I think it was the writer who said that he knew people who were in the military, and it was important to him that when they watched the movie, they'd be like, that's exactly right, that's how someone like that would react in that circumstance. This is a movie where we don't really get to know the dozen or so supporting characters who are on the train, but it manages to really imbue them with humanity, make their reactions to Stephen's apparently irrational behavior in a very realistic way. The movie wouldn't work anywhere near as well if they hadn't. And yeah, Jake Gyllenhaal plays Captain Coulter Stevens, who's very driven and yeah, he's, he's more interesting than he initially lets on, but I can't really talk about it without spoilers. According to IMDb Trivia, Topher Grace was considered for the role... I don't hate Topher Grace. Some I think sometimes I sound like I do. I think he did the best he could when he played Venom. I, I think he did. And when you listen to the commentary track of Spider-Man 3, he sounds like he really he really did put effort into it you know he was basically miscast 
but I don't think he would have been as good as Jake Gyllenhaal is in this. Jake Gyllenhaal had an earbud in during the train sequences into which the director would start playing music at any point in time to, hate, to help Gyllenhaal's character look disoriented. The director played random songs as well as static buzz at times, and it really worked. He, yeah, he's he's very disoriented, very convincingly so, and yeah. Now, yeah, you know the the Gyllenhaal is good at playing characters who are very driven to a, a you know. They really want to accomplish a certain goal. You know, once again, movies like, yeah, I already mentioned he's great in, you know, Nightcrawler is a great movie, he's great in it. Prisoners, End of Watch, Zodiac, yeah, and Michelle Monaghan plays Christina Warren, who's very sweet, and According to IMDb Trivia, Lindsay Lohan was originally cast in the role of Christina. However, producers decided to recast the role when her legal issues conflicted with the film schedule. Michelle Monaghan was eventually selected as her replacement. I don't really have any problem with Lindsay Lohan. I... Being a child star is hard. And I, I feel like, in at least some of her movies, you can tell that she really did try to, you know, yeah, she tried to continue being an actor into adulthood, which for many child stars just does not work out. I don't think she would have been quite as good as Michelle Monaghan is. And in one of the DVD extras, you know, the director talks about that he cast her based on Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and it makes sense. She's sweet, but also smart in both. Although Kiss Kiss Bang Bang gives her a lot more to do. And Vera Farmiga plays Captain Colleen Goodwin, who's very determined, and she's really, really good. The There's, again, a not, not a lot I can say. She's very clearly conflicted about something. I'm not going to give away what, but she does a really good job at getting that across. Like, there's a very real sense that she is following orders. And she, she knows that this is something she has to do, but she's really... She's very conflicted about it. And th that's something that could get kind of operatic and ridiculous like ultimately the 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 way you see it is that she like she talks to Coulter through like there's like a like a monitor and there's bits where she'll like she'll 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 have trouble looking directly at him and she'll she'll like look off to the side or like lean or, or these kinds of things and it could easily get exaggerated and it's a credit to both actress and director that they don't let that happen. She isn't quite as well utilized as in The Departed but you know that's maybe I'll make a I think I'll at some point make a, a video talking about, like, Martin Scorsese can sometimes be really good at, like, getting a lot out of actresses who others might not think so much of. I'm not sure that was... I'm not 100% certain if she... I, I think she might have already been thought of highly at the time, but, you know, when you look at... Sharon Stone in Casino and ah, what's the it's right on the tip of my tongue Cameron Diaz in Gangs of New York anyway Jeffrey Wright 
plays Dr. Rutledge and like I literally I've only ever seen him as this sort of like really educated professional kind of like in this he's a doctor in the Hunger Games movies he's you know basically like a, a scientist type and and in the invasion well let's see yeah it lists his his character is listed as Dr. Steven Galliano yeah yeah I think he's, yeah he's good at it you know what are you gonna do he's he's really good at conveying authority and expertise and I think those are going to be the only yeah those are the only actors I'll use here Stevens and Christina are very charming together have really great chemistry together some of the time the dialogue is like you know, characters talking the way people do in real life. None of the dialogue is just white noise. It does a decent job conveying characterization, exposition, and such. And the the character development early on, Stevens feels very disempowered, but later it starts to feel like he can really make a difference. And we see, like, yeah, early on he he's very frustrated and he kind of yeah you know I already mentioned the other passengers on the train he basically treats yeah like no, you know it doesn't matter how badly he treats them and then later on yeah I would say like the, the movie's heart stays with you for a while after watching. It, it's like you could easily see, like, I'm glad we live in the timeline where this movie, you know, they made sure that it had a heart because the concept could very easily just be, you know, it, it could still be fun for sure if it's just, you know, oh, he's got to try to figure out how to, you know, solve this in eight minutes, and the, but the fact that the movie has a heart really makes it significantly better. Now, the cinematography was handled by Don Burgess, and let's see, so yeah, I've seen movies that I've seen that he was director of the child for, include Aquaman, Terminator 3, Spider-Man, and Richie Rich. I watched Richie Rich. Wow, I barely remember that. Anyway, yeah, the the deep, you know, he he understood how to make it work, and there's some really great POV stuff where we're in Steven's head, and they mentioned on the commentary track that they used a specific type of camera that allowed them to film using almost only practical lighting and. It really, like, yeah, it, it worked out really well. And they filmed on the train for three weeks. So, one, you know, one of them jokes on the commentary track. Like, there, there's one character we see, like, lying, you know, sleeping on the train because it's a long trip. By the time the three, you know, by the time the three weeks were up, he was very well rested. And quoting fellow critics here, the cinematography is by Don Burgess, Spider-Man, who works in a bright, sunny style that is a refreshingly unconventional look for the genre. The cinematography by Don Burgess, Spider-Man, The Book of Eli, is quite phenomenal and appealing. Cinematography of Don Burgess does an excellent job with the film's cinematography from a desaturated look at the capsule interior to a more straightforward look to the look of the Air Force base, where... Captain Goodwin and Dr. Rutledge are at. Even the train has a look to it that is a bit stylish, but also straightforward for its presentation. Now, the movie was edited by Paul Hirsch, who edited Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, Ray, The Adventures of Pluto Nash, a classic, Mission Impossible 1, I Love Trouble, Raising Kane, 
the creep the 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 creep segment of creep show and Star Wars episodes four and five and Carrie and Obsession. So yeah, excellent editor there. And he does a really good job keeping things moving and not overwhelming us with information. Like if you if you want to try a, a you know if if you haven't watched the movie at all before and you feel like playing around with this, you can try to watch let's say try to start watching the movie 20 minutes in and then after you've watched some of the movie go back and watch the first 20 minutes and then see just how much it builds on the information that you get or you can also just watch it normally and try to notice okay what information do I get from the first 20 minutes and yeah quoting fellow critics here there are lots of stylish camera and editing techniques lavished on the film which seems to be trying very hard to get the audience to experience what Stevens is experiencing without being too gimmicky to the point of jolting them off the tra trajectory of the story applied to another film they probably are gimmicky. Come to think of it, the film deserves an Oscar nomination for editor for editing as well. Editor Paul Hirsch does a nice job of the editing by giving the film a pace that plays up to its suspense while slowing things down so that audiences can be engaged into what is happening. Even as it relies on swift transitions and fast-paced cuts to move from reality to surreal reality. And the... Let's see. There's, there's a montage where Stevens... Like, it has this very suitable defeatist feel. Like, Stevens is basically... You know, every time he goes through these eight minutes, he has to experience this massive fireball explosion every single time. So, yeah, him him trying to make progress but having trouble. Yeah. And... For some of it, obviously, you know, they didn't actually blow up a metro train car, but you might be surprised by at least some of what was effects and what was done practically. The, yeah, the effects are, are very convincing. And it's the right amount. It's not a showy movie. And the stunt work is good. It was made on a budget of $31.9 million and it made $147.3 million. So, quite a success. And you can see why. Like, I could imagine some people might have watched it more than once. And I think if, if, you, if you have the opportunity to watch it more than once, you know, maybe, maybe don't watch it twice in too close succession, but watch it again when you, you know, when you remember the twists, but by the time that the movie's impact is, like, so, so that you can experience the impact of it again, but knowing the twists and thus able to pick up on hints the military facility that the project is run out of feels like a real place where people actually work. Either, even, that, even though it either doesn't exist or certainly doesn't run this kind of experiment out of it. And yeah, so it was shot in Quebec and Chicago. Now the the action scenes are like quick, tight, and dirty, and it feels very real. Now there is, yeah, there, you know, among among the different types of action scenes, there is some chasing on foot, some shooting 
there's some simple fighting, not martial arts or something. I would say, like, don't expect much of an uh, action movie. I, I think I would maybe more call it a thriller than an action movie. Now, let's see. So yeah, this is one of those movies where the and the villain's plan makes sense, and that was the idea, and the hero's plan makes sense most of the time, at least, and that is also the idea. The scenes are easy to follow, they're meant to be, and I think that was the right choice. Now the music and score, some of it is like loud and aggressive. It was handled by Chris Bacon. The only other movie I've seen that he did the music for is Men in Black International. So yeah, but it's you know, it's very suspenseful and tense, certainly. And the sound design, they, they do a really good job of putting sound to an experience that doesn't experience that doesn't exist in real life, waking up in the past. And the there's some black comedy and blue comedy in this. And yeah, so so violence is mild enough for a PG-13, although some of the implied stuff is, is, is really messed up, but yeah, you know, fighting, shooting, and such. And there's a little moderate to strong profanity. I, I think they did a, a good job of, like, there's not too much violence or I don't mind profanity, but I, you know, I don't think this movie would have been as, like, I love Pulp Fiction, but I, I'm not sure the dialogue of Pulp Fiction would have worked well here. Now, It has a fairly high level of realism. The only real thing you need to suspend its belief for is the the technology, you know. The idea of putting someone's brain back in the, the past. It's not a terribly contrived Yeah. It's it's not very contrived. Now pacing. With a running time of 83 minutes, not counting the end credits, 89 width. And the first, as we're waiting for the film to establish what we go into it already knowing, or at least the entertainment until it gets there, and last quarter of an hour not being all that compelling, we're left with a middle that is enjoyable enough. And yeah, you know, it's it's worth watching at least once. If you really get into it, if you're not interested, 30 minutes in, it, the movie isn't your kind of thing. It doesn't feel much longer or shorter than it actually is. It's not one of those movies where you need to fast forward through the boring parts. I think a really strong case can be made that you'll probably enjoy the movie more if you stop it right before the ending. Honestly, you'll probably know when you should, but just in case, here's a, a brief description of the last thing you should see. So, spoilers for the movie, as we zoom over my index finger. You'll see someone as their life support stops. No more spoilers for the time being. I don't wish the movie was longer or shorter. It is the right length. And... You know, this is one of those things where, like, if the if the movie's too short or long, you know, what should be added or subtracted, character, plot, etc. It has about the right amount of plot and character. You know, er early on, you might feel like the movie just isn't going to get very in-depth with some of these characters. And, once again, for a number, you know, 
a number of the supporting cast, it really doesn't get very in-depth. But for several of the main major characters, yeah, you, you might be surprised by how much depth there ends up being to them. Now, on more than one occasion, Stevens pressures Christina in, into something she doesn't want to do, invades her personal space, clearly past her comfort level. That can get very uncomfortable to watch. I think the idea is supposed to be that it's... What's the word? Yeah, given the romance, I think the idea is supposed to be that it's one of those... You know, it's, it's one of those things where you kind of accept that someone is behaving kind of weirdly because you're secretly attracted to them kind of thing. Yeah. I would say that the best element of the movie is the solving of the mystery in Steven's character growth, and it's worth watching the movie for, for it at least once. The worst aspect is the ending, and yeah, you know, if, if, you, if you simply stop watching the movie right before the very ending, yeah. Now, other people really didn't like the romance. I can understand. Like, it is... I don't love the romance, but... Okay, ironic. Don't you think? But the... the you know... I think they probably figured that if they were going to have any chance of bringing women into this movie... That's not me saying. I'm, I'm just saying I think that's what the producers were thinking. We have to put some romance in here or women won't watch this movie at all. You know, the, and, and definitely it's, it's like the concept. I could, I could understand people who would say that the concept is just the, you know, that the, I, I think that, I think women would have watched it for the, the heart of the movie, though, but, yeah. Now, the thing I was most worried about about the movie was that there would be no sense of urgency, and the movie exceeded my expectations. I was most looking forward to the time travel loop element, and the movie exceeded my expectations. Now... The... So yeah, the movie is entertaining to watch. For some, for sure, some people will find the ending very emotional. It doesn't really leave you in a negative state of mind, although, you know, well, actually, that depends on how deep you look into the ethical issues raised. And yeah, I would say the movie is good as a whole, other than the ending and. Thankfully, it is one of those kinds of things where you really, like, if you know exactly when to stop watching, you can just stop watching at that point, and it's not, like, there are a lot of movies where I would say, ah, oh, you know, the ending's nowhere near as good as earlier, but, I mean, you kind of have to watch the ending because some things are only resolved at the very ending. The movie leaves a number of unanswered questions, I think. That's a good thing. There are mostly answers to the mysteries themselves. And that is a good thing. The trailers do give away a little bit too much. Both the 2 minute 23 second one and the 2 minute 1 second one. I also found one that was a minute and 56, but that's apparently just the 2 minute 23 one, but with the ending abruptly cut off. But at the same time, the trailers do give you a good idea of what the movie is like, so if you like the trailer, you like the movie. If you don't like the trailer, you may not like the movie. It, it, the, the trailers capture the essence of the film fairly well. The cover and poster do not give too much away about the movie and give you a pretty good idea of, yeah, again, if you like the cover and or poster, you'll like the movie. If you don't, you might not. The one thing is that 
they kind of make it look like a bigger action movie than it is, and that's, yeah. But I, I get it. It's, it's difficult. This is a, a movie that's difficult to sum up in one image without promising too much. Now, the movie doesn't really have a lot of metaphors that don't understand elements. There is a reasonable amount of depth and some stuff to analyze. And you probably won't need to watch it more than once, but it I appreciate it much more on repeat viewings. And you might not expect there to be as much character development in this movie as there is. And I hate to say it, but there is a little bit of 9/11 disaster, 9/11 uh, porn in in this. You know, the whole thing with you know, piece of public transportation. Yeah, piece of public transportation is used for a terrorist attack, explosion, and you know the the. Yeah. For, for these, some of these videos, I try to go into whether this, whether the movie should really just have been an episode of the Twilight Zone. I think this could have worked well as a Twilight Zone episode. It, I don't think the movie is, yeah, usually when I, when I, when there's a movie that should have been a Twilight Zone episode, the movie has padding. You know, this movie doesn't really have padding, it has depth instead. It's obviously it's limited how much depth you can get into in a let's see what is it forty four minute episode that has to introduce and resolve a concept that like you know oh everything in the episode because they're usually one offs but I think there is a um, potentially fun episode in it if if you took a basically the same idea but you know changed it a little. Made it a little, yeah. Made it made it a little more shallow, but also just, yeah. I, I think it could work well. And, I mean, I'm not the first person to point out that it is watching this movie is kind of like playing a video game or watching someone play a video game. What with the multiple attempts at you know, solving the same problem, starting at the same area, you know, if this was a video game, then he's basically replaying the same level because he keeps dying before beating the level. And I have some, I have a suggestion for how to fix the movie's ending, which will be at the very start of the section entitled Notes Taken Before Watching. Now, the um, there weren't a ton of YouTube videos dealing with this movie, but I will briefly... I, I have some recommendations for them. I recommend both of the Folding Ideas videos, the He Made Me Watch video, and also... And, and as far as written reviews, I recommend Outlaw Vern's review, but that's that goes without saying the abridged script, noting that everything I've just mentioned has spoilers for this movie. And if you want something spoiler-free that might help you decide whether the movie is for you or not, the reviews by Roger Ebert, R.I.P., and Marianne Johansson. Marianne Johansson does get into some spoilers, but she separated those from the review itself. If you go to her site, and do do the the search. Ah, what's her called again? Ah, I I forget. But yeah, I'm pr I'm pretty sure if you like, if you Google Marianne Johansson reviews, it'll, you'll find it. Now, so.
So the this has a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes based on 263 reviews. So that is mighty well received. That yeah, I and it has an 82% audience score based on more than 100,000 ratings. So yeah, people like this movie. And the critics' consensus is finding a human story amidst the action. Director Duncan Jones and charming Jake Gyllenhaal craft a smart, satisfying sci-fi thriller. On Metacritic, the critics gave it 74 out of 100, or you know, it averages out to 74 out of 100, and the user ratings average out to 7.7 .7 out of 10. And fairly recent user reviews, I found some as recent as from the 9th of April this year. And let's see. Huh. Right, yeah. And there are forty one Metacritic reviews and one hundred and twenty four user reviews on Meta. Yeah, Metacritic, yeah. And on IMDb, it has 668 review, user reviews and 540, you know, reviews in the IMDb external reviews section. So, yeah, it's it's been... People care enough to, to write about it. And... Yeah, so I recommend this movie to fans of time traveling through stories. And I recommend the DVD to those who, like, if you think you're going to like the movie and you can find the DVD on sale, but then I always say get it on sale, but it has some, some pretty good stuff. And the, the DVD comes with the three and the latter two alternate subtitles and a few minutes short piece of text will come up neither of them spoil anything so you can just put them on for the first few informational tracks the first one is the audio commentary with Jake Gyllenhaal, director Duncan Jones and writer Ben Ripley the second is ac called access source code trivia, facts that have some connection to what's on screen so it's a say no smoking sign telling us when such a ban was first done they don't really have anything to do with the movie itself it's funny in a quirky sort of way, it's, since it's like watching a film with an easily distracted sentient encyclopedia which responds to the visuals with free association. After a while, I started trying to guess, sometimes successfully, what it would pick to spout stuff about. And the third one is Tales of Time Travel. Titles and short descriptions of the time travel stories, most of them films, in no particular order. It's decent, but it might as well have been text in a menu. Like, I, I think a lot of people would prefer to get all these titles without having to sit through the movie itself, just, you know, yeah. Honestly, you would almost think that though those are like, that, that the people making the DVD were desperate to make sure that the people, that people buying the DVD would watch the movie through as many times as possible, you know, okay, so let's see. They're going to watch it once, just with no nothing extra. They're going to watch it with commentary track. They're going to watch it with random facts. They're going to watch it with time travel story titles. It's just like, yeah. But I'm pretty sure that's not the case. So I don't, anyway. And three interesting featurettes. The 26-minute cast and crew insights, interviews. The six and a half minute focal points, the concepts are explained, and 18 minute expert intel. Physics professor discusses the realism of different aspects of the movie. And trailers for Unknown, Brighton Rock, Attack the Block, and This and an Ad from Mars. It's it, kind of some, something that I don't know. I just I think it's a little amusing. When the physics professor starts up, it's clear that he expected for, like, apparently he was, he, he, they, they sat him down watching the movie, and he would just record basically like a commentary track, 
but I guess the I, I mean they edited it down to 18 minutes and it doesn't play over clips of the movie at all it's just audio in the menu so I guess they they felt that it didn't need the visuals and I don't know it just I always notice when when I start watching a DVD feature a special feature and it's being introduced as if like yeah, he, he thought that it was going to be a, a commentary track. Some I've, I've also seen some DVDs where it's a commentary track, and clearly the people thought that, they, that there would be video of them during the commentary track, because they don't introduce themselves at all, which is... So, so yeah, they... Anyway. I rate this seven attempts at preventing terrorism by redoing the same eight minutes over again out of 10. And that is it for the review. Yes. So, so, spoilers throughout the rest of this video. And we are now in thoughts section start. Disclaimers. Uh, if you don't care about these disclaimers, I try and keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try and talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of this is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section. Once I get into the rest of the video itself, with that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I am only spoiling this movie. I may bring up movies and TV shows that are relevant. But I either will not spoil them, or I will warn right before I do so verbally and hold up an index finger so that you can mute and skip ahead if you want to avoid the spoilers. So, let's see. Instead of me quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say here, I loved every line they put in the IMDb quote section. So you can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. So, the rest of this video is not a review, it's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it's analysis, some of it's MC creative attraction for the jokes. Especially, uh, ah, never mind. And the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The section right after this one is thoughts that I had while watching, in chronological order, you can think of it as a running commentary live tweeting like. And the section after that is thoughts that I had before watching. And. So, for some of these, I, I sometimes look at, does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? And whether it does or not, do I think they might have made the right choice? I mean, the movie doesn't really have empathy for Derek Frost, and I don't think it really should. So, yeah, but I appreciate that it has empathy for all the other characters. And that it does actually say, you know, just because you see someone looking nervous, and especially if you, you know, especially if you see someone that, you know, yeah, just because you see someone looking nervous doesn't mean that they're up to no good. And do not racially profile. Now... I think they did a, a good job not, like, their, Derek Frost doesn't have a lot of screen time, so we don't, like, we, we, we don't really get used to him, and I think we are told enough about his motivation, but I can understand those who disagree. Now, that brings us to the next section. Notes taken while watching. Christina grabbing Sean's ticket from his pocket really does show how much she and the real Sean trust each other. She actually looks a little surprised that he is surprised that she would do it. Or, or is that just that she's still surprised that he doesn't just get out the ticket. Anyway. 
Hey, mister, you forgot your wallet. Nice subtle detail. You don't pick it up the first time you watch. But that is actually a huge clue as to the identity of the bomber. You even get to see his face. But the camera doesn't really focus on it. It's a background detail. We can really understand why Stevens, you know, kind of freaks out. When, like, uh, actually, yeah, I, I should. I'm, I'm talking about that first time before the explosion where, you know, he was just in the, in the bathroom and he, he doesn't recognize the face when he lo looks in the mirror, you know. And then he walks out and Christina's like, are you okay? And he freaks out. And you can really, it's easy to understand why. The explosion, of course, doesn't get equal detail each time we see it. But this first time definitely is a very effective showing of it. So the, is the fr freight train, is that what they're called? Passes by next to their train and a few seconds later the train blows up so now we know the timing of it. I do appreciate that when the movie opens the mission is already underway. This is not the first time Stevens is in the pod. It's just that he's forgotten the other ones so we don't have to spend a lot of time seeing how it starts up. Once we understand the concept we really don't need to see how it starts. The whole thing of rebooting his brain using the pattern is clever. It forces him to use different parts of his brain, you know. And it, again, like you can you can try it for yourself. Just you know, let's see. So the the he's he's told a short a, a story that's in like two sentences, and then he's told is it like four uh, playing playing cards? Is that what they're called? You know, with like uh, um, aces and clubs and diamonds and hearts. Is that what they're called? Whatever. No, not aces. Whatever. Yeah. Playing cards. And after he's given that information, then he's asked to arrange the cards in, in what was it, in descending order, regardless of the, what was it, the coat? Is that what they're called? I forget. And the and and then he's asked to to say you know the, I, I forget I think is it the color of the dress that Lily was wearing or something like that you know so it makes sure that he he's not just spitting out the same information he was given he's taking that information comparing it to knowledge he has and he's he's like applying that knowledge to to arrange the information in a new way, and then, uh, what's it called, present the information in the way uh, requested. And yeah, as, as far as I understand, at least, the different things, the different parts of that activates different parts of his brain, and that's what they need to do, because he's, he's basically a brain in, in a, you know, What's it called? In like a, in a pod, you know. So so they have to make sure that his brain is is you know has has started going is is moving. Right before Goodwin sends him back, he in he insists on being told the condition of his crew, etc. So it it is this like because to him that just happened, you know. He he keeps. Like, his brain is having trouble processing that. And actually, yeah, they have they already erased his memory at least once? Maybe, and that's why he... Yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% certain on that one. And now that Sean isn't behaving so confused about what's going on, Christina goes further down the path of conversation. You know, the first time she was just like, I took your advice, it was very good advice. And then this time... She, she starts talking about the, let's see, there's the thing about, like, going, going to, going to India to meet a guru to find herself, something like that. In the second run-through, Stevens legitimately seems to think that, yeah, legitimately does think that it's a simulation. He can't believe that it's real. And so he treats the fellow fellow, pass, fellow passengers like they aren't real. 
I mean, pretending to be security to get to check their electronic devices is pretty clever, and I like that the the ah, what's it called that the the writing is realistic enough that several people see right through it. Of course, Stevens isn't going to be able to come up with a great way to handle it the first time. This is not what his training is. He's basically making it up as he goes along. You now he's had. He has military training. He's not a spy. He's not a security whatever. So, you know, he, he grabs his his driver's license and holds it up and says, Security, security. We we have a we have a what was it? Uh, uh, there's a there's been an alert about a security issue, so I'm just gonna have to look. Don't worry about it, it's just a precautionary measure. And then one of them's like, Well, which is it? Is there a security alert or is it or is it a precautionary measure, you know? And as Goodwin talks about what sh Stevens should look for, you know, someone nervous, you can tell that she's uncomfortable about how they're treating Stevens. You, you maybe don't realize at that exact time that that's, you know, you can tell she's uncomfortable about something. It's, it's, very fun as Christina pretends to be playing the game. Was that the bomber that Sean asked about the cell service? I mean, it's too early for the call to set off the bomb, so I guess it's just subliminally planting in the audience's mind that that guy sure is on the phone, huh? I think it's supposed to be like romantic that Stevens pressures Christina into sitting right next to him and he kisses her without consent, but it's legitimately uncomfortable. And Steven feels cold and the equipment in the pod seems to go out, which we realize later in the movie it's actually his brain trying to comprehend being like you know, be, being kept alive in the, the pod. It's hard to say exactly what he's going through. Meanwhile, he appears to be trying to go through the ceiling. But she survived. Maybe the rest of them could too. She will spend the rest of her life in therapy, but she did survive. And Dr. Rutledge gives something of an explanation of the technology. I pulled her off. Not literally, obviously. Do you trust me? No. Wow, that was painfully honest. That's that's legitimately funny. That's and and like I really appreciate the 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 cliche dodge, the the expectation subversion there. Like you when 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 he starts to ask the question, do you trust me, like, the moment that the words start to come out of his mouth, we, the audience, are like, oh, he's going to ask him, she trusts him, she's going to say yes, she's going to go along with it. So, so it's really cool that, and, like, realistically, yeah, I, I don't, like, given the, the, like, okay, they've known each other for a while and, and such, but with how weird he's behaving, no, she doesn't trust him beyond that, so, yeah. Who are you and what have you done to Sean Fentress? Let's be honest, that was the very first line written of the entire script. He had to put that somewhere in there. Every obnoxious, um, actually nerd on the internet would be complaining if he didn't. It's just too obvious. It's a good detail, the first time Steven tries to steal the gun, he completely and utterly fails. Of course the trained personnel would be watching it, and he was acting super suspicious, like very sus. And Stevens is like kind of snarky at Goodwin about the idea of stealing the gun in the lockbox, which does go along with uh, like how this movie is like a video game. That's like, if it's, yeah. I've, I've, seen gamers get really frustrated about getting supposedly bad advice for how to approach a video game. I wouldn't completely rule out that I myself may have been snarky in response to getting bad advice. But, yeah. 
Stephen asks Good Stevens asks Goodwin to call his father and he, he, re repeatedly and her body language continues to show she's very uncomfortable with how they're treating him. Obviously you only realize that that that's exactly why in retrospect. And Stephen tries to find out what military patch Goodwin was wearing. I appreciate that when Stevens talks about having a friend in the military that died, Christina is very solemn. It's only when he talks to her about how he himself is someone other than who she knows him to be, that's when she doesn't believe him. I really, I really, really laugh at Christina's line about her phone being connected to the office by a really long piece of string that's, and she delivers it well, as well, you know, it's like, she, she starts telling the joke and she's cracking up as she's telling the joke. When Steven tries to talk to Christina and said he's been having vivid dreams and she's in them, I mean, for, for like 30 seconds or something, the movie is basically just a romantic comedy for, for that brief bit. Like, that's that's right out of, 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 yeah. But you can understand how, like, he, he starts to think, okay, I can't tell her that I know this train is going to explode. Maybe if I say that I've been having dreams about it and I could tell her that she's been in the dreams and then as he's saying it he realizes oh it sounds like I am saying sex dreams and I mean to their credit both of the actors play it exactly right for how it's written so that's yeah I wonder how many people just, like, I mean, between this and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, like, clearly, some people in Hollywood really like seeing Michelle Monaghan be, like, exasperated and, like, be, did you seriously just say that kind of just, yeah. And Stevens manages to get some information out of the, the, the woman... Who, you know, she she like she knows just enough about the military patch kind of thing. You know, clearly she's not okay with how he treated the guy with the bang. I mean, I've seen, I've probably seen at least a hundred movies where a main character goes up to a character we only meet briefly and asks for for some information, gets information, and then leaves. And almost all of them don't stick with me, but she does because they have that detail in there. You know, she she's like, I saw what you did to that man. That's not right. You shouldn't treat people like that. And he's like, you know, the military. Oh, that's what they teach you in the military to treat people like that. And you know, and he's like, okay, uh, um, look, I'll 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 buy your phone. I don't I don't want your money. Just bring the phone back. You know, that that whole because. Yeah, like she, I mean, she would feel guilty if she sold him something. She would feel like she was helping someone that she doesn't, you know. She's like, okay, borrow the phone, fine, but just, so, yeah. And Stevens tried calling Goodwin's number, and this is the number that, or actually, was it for Rutledge, but, I, and anyway, I think it's the number for Goodwin that he then texts later. And Christina looked up Stevens and confirmed what Goodwin said. He died. I appreciate how difficult a time Stevens has accepting that he really is dead. And we see that he actually remembers his death. And, like, his brain probably tried to push those thoughts away before. But now he, you know, because he couldn't really make sense of them. It's like, well, I mean, it obviously is not real because I didn't die. I'm right here. And Stevens realizes the capsule isn't real. 
It's really harsh when Dr. Rutledge says Stevens is a hand on a clock. Some, just a tool for them to use. And then they play the really heart-wrenching, you know, it's really heart-wrenching listening to the speech that Stevens' father gave about him, but it does make a lot of sense that it really motivates Stevens. And Stephen thinks that he's got the guy. Thankfully, the guy is able to keep calm and ask Stephen's call again. He does, and it confirms his innocence. And then Stephen is able to deduce it's Derek Frost. You know, he, he doesn't know his name yet, but, you know, we, we, yeah. It's the guy that's identified as Derek Frost. And, you know, he gets his full name from his wallet. And it is really, really cool looking when Steams jumps out of the moving train and just rolls and rolls on the ground. And thankfully, it's completely fake. It's a special effect. They didn't actually ask a stuntman to do that for real. That would be just so wrong, so messed up. But it's it's really cool. And, like, apparently, like, Duncan Jones is a confirmed gamer. And he actually based that jump on, like, he, he did a jump like that in a Grand Theft Auto game. And it also really hurt his character there, so he thought it would be cool to do in the, in the movie as well. So, yeah. So around 53 minutes into the movie, so let's see, it was 83. So so yeah, 30 minutes before the. Yeah, for the for the last. Yeah, the last 30 minutes of the movie, Stevens knows Derek Frost is the terrorist. And has his full name, and then the license plate of the car. Not long after that, he sees the bomb, and Derek is giddy about showing off the bomb. Not many people can build that. I guess a voice told him, "If you build it, it will blow." And he's more upset that Stephen messed up his timing than having killed Christina, which is just a. Ah, I think I killed your girlfriend. And and Stevens gives the information and asks that he be allowed to try to save the people on the train. And Goodwin smiles when congratulating Stevens. Genuinely, one of the rare moments when she feels good about this job. And he manages gradually manages to convince Goodwin to trust him and sent back in. And uh, yes, just, just trust him. Send him back in to switch him off. And it is legitimately quite fun to watch this last eight minute run where Stevens essentially does a perfect speed run. He knows exactly what moves to make every step of the way. I've been waiting for weeks for you to ask me for coffee. I am very thirsty by now. And we again see how little Dr. Rutledge cares about Stevens when he says, wipe SC1, you know, using just, I mean, he's talking about, like, wiping his memory, you know, taking away, yeah. For all we know, he might be the only person compatible with source code, in which case you were full of it when you just said that with the right funding you could have eight source codes running. You're going to clone him or what? It is supremely satisfying when Stevens has Derek handcuffed and can taunt him. And it's very powerful when Stevens calls his father and offers condolences. A chance to talk to his father even though he's technically been dead for weeks now. And it is sweet when Stevens gives the stand-up comedian money to make everyone on the train laugh. I do think that the bit here at the end with him going past eight minutes because his life support is turned off at the exact right moment would hit harder if we were 100% certain that he couldn't last the eight minutes if that wasn't the case. And the movie hasn't actually shown us that that isn't the case. The two times that he wasn't on the train when it blew up, he still ended up dying within the eight minutes. It wasn't that the eight minutes were up. It was that he got ran over by a train and shot, respectively. 
I feel bad that Goodwin is going to fa face the consequences for turning off the life support, but I do appreciate that Stevens was able to contact her. And even here at the end, we see Doug Rutledge is basically hoping for a terrorist attack so he can use source code. Now, let's see. Brings us to the next section. Notes taken before watching. So, as promised in the review, I'm going to start with my suggestion for how to improve the ending. Because it's really messed up that at the end of the movie, Stevens takes over Sean Fentress' life. Sean didn't do anything to deserve that. See, hypothetically, if it was like Derek, that could actually be... Uh, one second, I need to... If it was a thing of like, yeah, like, like, make Derek, like, ah, let's see. Ah, I mean, it's still ethically. Okay, all I'll say is, it seems more like a punishment than, than a, like, Sean Fentress didn't do anything. Apparently, he's been treating Christina well, you know, so... It's, it seems like he's a good person. Anyway, you know, besides which, the ending wouldn't remain a happy ending for very long. You know, you can watch The Dark Side of Source Code. He made me watch Source Code for detailed explanations. And I do think that the movie could have had a sort of positive, if not necessarily outright happy ending. I think we can all agree that the, the people in the eight minutes living on not being blown up is an appealing idea. I will grant that it is perhaps a very romantic notion that you can save everyone, at least within that one, you know, alternate dimension. I think the really big problem arises when Stephen gets to take over Sean's life. So my suggestion is, instead of Goodwin sending him back one more time, Stephen suggests that they run the program without putting his mind into Sean's body, and then Sean and Christina get to live on. You could even have Goodwin offering Stephen's, but if I put you back, in you can live on to which he responds but sean wouldn't i'm not going to take away one man's life to get my own back bittersweet ending but i don't think there's a way to have a fully happy ending the way the concept is in my personal opinion this ending would be a huge improvement so i mentioned in the review that i recommend the editing room a bridge script i especially love the line containing the words i'm going to call the president in the video he made me watch source code, they point out that it doesn't actually make sense that apparently Goodwin can, like, you know, apparently Goodwin can't see Stevens or hear him, he's just words on a monitor. Because the rhythm of the conversation necessitates that she can see him and hear him. I get that, like, th you know, this way it makes more sense scientifically speaking, but I do think they should have had him actually be a face on a monitor and for being able to hear what he says failing that they should have made the conversations feel more realistic for him being words on a monitor but that's really a way less compelling viewing experience but yeah like the the like isn't there already some technology I'm, I'm not i'm not expecting you to respond i mean you could put it in the comments and i'll read it but other than that I'm thinking out loud. I think there is already technology where, like, someone's brain can can produce words on a on a screen with, you know. So so, I I get that that makes, yeah. And on the commentary track, over the end credits, the star writer and director go over all the reasons that the ending isn't happy and they don't seem to mind. They're sarcastically calling it a happy ending, chuckling through some of the description of it. And... Quoting a fellow critic, After all the game overing and toing and throwing, it comes to a point at which you think it might finally let itself do something tough and honest, something with a bit of stick to itness, and it doesn't. When Source Code finally does something daring, it's worse than a cheat. It's a horrific tragedy it doesn't even realize is a horrific tragedy. It's offered up as a triumph, where the whole endeavor could have been 
kind of, sort of, okay, but not really all that great, if you're honest about it, it ends up being hugely distasteful and idiotic for not even realizing that it is really well put. I think that might be Marianne Johansson, but I forget. I wonder if Stevens would have stopped existing in the alternate reality where he got off the train if he hadn't been run over since Stevens' body back in the real world was still on life support at that point. If, like, if Sean would have woken up and they could easily have done that. You know, they could have actually that maybe it's me, but I feel like that whole bit where he ends up on the train tracks is a little weird because it seems like he accepts okay, it can't be this guy because his phone is right there and the train blew up. I just heard it and so on. But then he jumps at him again and then he ends up on the train. Feels like the they kind of just needed him to end up like if hypothetically if I, I think the the scene would have worked better if just as he's saying that and he sees, you know, oh, it blew up. He checks he checks the digital watch, so, which he set to go, you know, down, yeah, count down eight minutes. He sees that it's like, yeah, he it, it reaches zero as he's looking at it. And he maybe starts saying, oh, no, or something. And then suddenly, like, yeah, so suddenly... Sean wakes up, you know, and and he's really confused about where he is, and he panics, and he takes a few steps back, and accidentally steps over the edge and lands on the tracks. I think that would have made much more sense, but I guess if they had that, then people would have had a harder time at the end of the movie not thinking about, well, what happened to Sean Fentress? I appreciate that instead of the bomber being a Middle Eastern looking Muslim, it's a right winger since there are way more terrorist attacks carried out in America by right wingers than Middle Eastern looking Muslims. Stevens is clearly wrong when he early on harasses the Middle Eastern looking guy, and this is something that the movie recognizes. In the video he made me watch, one of the two guys says that basically Michelle Monaghan's role is this idealized role where she just smiles and goes along with what Steven, Stevens wants and needs. I agree, and I think it's too bad, you know, a lot of movies basically either write the woman as very idealized or they write her realistically, and audience members who empathize more with the male lead really hate her, the female lead. Basically, we the viewer have seen all the that he has run through, but her character hasn't, so she should recognize how his behavior is completely ridiculous, you know, from, from her point of view, and Apparently she was cast in this because the director liked her in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Now, that movie does initially present her as sort of an idealized woman in one of these. She's attractive, she has interesting things to say, and she actually is the girl that... Actually, yeah, I guess that's kind of spoil. Okay, so spoilers for Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. She actually is the girl that Robert Downey Jr.'s character has been in love with since high school. But that movie does go on to subvert expectations, essentially saying that the first time you meet a girl that you're really in love with, you have an idealized vision of her. The first time you see an attractive girl in the movie, you have an idealized vision of her. The, you know, that movie subverts the expectation, and so could this movie have. No more spoilers for Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. I know that they're saying there'll be a sequel. I'm not really excited about it. I'd really much rather have a spiritual successor. Now, let's see. Right, so I have a few more notes on the commentary track. So apparently the writer originally wanted to do something like Rashomon and then gradually it became what the movie is now. And originally Sean and Christina would be strangers, not people, you know, yeah, rather than people who knew each other. And the the helicopter window looks like the window to the, the pod that Stevens is actually in. And they wanted to make sure the cockpit looked real, not futuristic. And they liked that it was creepy that Stevens, 
you know, the, the way Stevens is basically following the the nervous looking non-white guy who gets off the train. And Jake Gyllenhaal would ask the director why he can't climb out the window and other things like that so that he would and and it led to him you know and, and the director would have an answer and it yeah you know they, they were talking about that it, it made the movie better that that dialogue was had they liked to show more of the lab to keep it from being like claustrophobic you know at very early in the movie we see very little of the lab but later we see much more of it and they said uh, Dr. Rutledge does believe he's doing the right thing and like there was a, a door that Stevens is trying to open and they had to have people on the other side of the door holding it tight so that it wouldn't open before it was supposed to they like it when Steven says the F word. Once again, I don't mind. I just, I know some people do. That's why I said the F word instead of saying the F word. And the director liked being able to use Scott Bakula in the ah, cameo as a homage to ah, his show. Quantum Leap, that's it. And Jake Gyllenhaal pointed out that at one point Stevens has too many props to deal with. He has to make a call, hold a gun, and, and more things all at once without... And I forget which of them, but one of them said the audience can really viscerally feel when Stevens jumps out of the moving train. And the, the people on the comments are trying to feel like they did a good job making the, the bad guy someone you didn't expect. And there's very... Um, it was an intent, intentional decision, careful decision, to make sure that the camera not move but lie still when they're lying, dying outside the train. And the director and Jake say that they do think the ending makes sense. They almost reveal why Dr. Rutledge needs... Yeah, why, what, what's, I don't know what, hmm, he, he has a limp, and they almost go into why, and another bit where Jake says, I'm handling too many props at once, when he has a gun, two phones, and a pair of handcuffs, and they say that when Stevens calls, you know, and and Derek realizes he's gonna lose. Derek looks like a a child that you've taken candy from, which is a little bit disturbing that they know what that looks like. And they said it was incredible what the the ah, what's it called the the body in the pod at the end can because that's not actually Jake Gyllenhaal. It's a you know they they built that and apparently. The body could breathe, roll its eyes, and the, the brain could swell, so, yeah. It's too bad that they didn't use more of that. It, or I, I wish they at least put it, like, uh, maybe do a, like a, a gag reel kind of thing. Where I, I get why they didn't push it further in the movie, but... They didn't have the budget to film Stephen's father, so they decided that you only hear him. And on multiple occasions, Christina says everything's going to be okay, but the train explodes right after. Only at the end, when Stevens believes her, does it not explode. He lets go of the piece of him that's only half alive. 
and at the end they said maybe Rutledge doesn't believe he's creating alternate realities, maybe he just doesn't care that he might be. And that was all of my notes. So I think I will just very, very briefly let's see, is it is this the one? Yeah, I think I'll just super just real brief. Gonna re read aloud my my favorite parts of the abridged script. So so yeah, the 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 still image they use for it is the bit where Jake is uh, yeah where he's he's handcuffed and he's sitting down and Christina is in front of him and so the this is the the line that you know as if she's saying this all right Jake I'll ask but I don't think they'll let you drive the choo choo yeah that was slightly put the put the emphasis on the wrong syllable there and let's So, yeah, the, the, um, in the abridged script, Jake Gyllenhaal realizes that maybe the, yeah, the problem, the reason that the train blows up is that the, yeah, he says, I must be locked into the never aired season finale of the short lived, ill fated Canadian TV show Train 48. If I can just flood the train with enough Canadian content, the government will sink heaps of money into it and the show won't be cancelled, hence the train won't explode. And then there's a, a list of Canadian stuff he puts in, but the train explodes anyway. And. Yeah, and, and it points out that it doesn't make any sense that, uh, you know, that the that Jake is just inside a dead man's memories. How could he possibly be moving around? And then Vera Farmiga says, either way, Jake, we still need you to keep trying. And she slaps an oversized red butt and goes, abracadabra. It kind of feels like Groundhog Day in here. Maybe if I master the piano and win an ice sculpting contest, that'll save everyone. I've noticed that my dad is... But, but it explodes. I've noticed that my dad is voiced by Scott Bakula of Quantum Leap fame. Maybe the secret is to call Dean Stockwell and ask what Siggy says. But the train still explodes. Yeah, and, and then it talks about that, like, Jake Gyllenhaal really kicks the Mad Bomber's ass. I mean, he doesn't really do that in the movie. I'm not, I, I guess it's just how, I, I think Alex W. was the one who wrote the abridged script. I guess that's how he wished it had played out. Yeah, I'm just going to read the entire... Okay, so after the the other bomb is stopped, Jeffrey Wright says, You did it, Jake. Source code is a success. We can now prevent any act of terrorism, provided there's an earlier, less tragic act of terrorism committed by the same perpetrators. It claims the life of at least one thirty-something white male who, by my own admission, must vaguely resemble Jake Gyllenhaal while leaving his brain intact. I'm calling the president. That is the, yeah, yeah. And yeah, that's it. And 
and yeah, it it proves that you know it turns out that Jake Gyllenhaal was right, and he can live on past the eight minutes. Excellent! I get to live a new life with Michelle Monaghan. I rescued everyone on the train, and my theory is validated. Not so much Jeffrey right, more like Jeffrey wrong. Uh huh. Huh? Hashtag winning. And then the audience goes, er, you do realize this means you created and destroyed a couple dozen alternate universe trains full of living alternate universe people, thus horrifically multiplying the body count in order to save one set of people that didn't even exist before you created them. No, you see, it, and, and J. Gyllenhaal responds, no, you see, it's okay because I got what I wanted. And Michelle Monaghan points out, also the original guy that I had a crush on has had his consciousness cruelly wrenched out of him to make room for yours, so any relationship that you and I have will be based on a gruesome deceit. And then Jake Gyllenhaal says, whatever, I'm going to stare at our reflection in this giant silver beam. And it ends. And, yeah, so that's it. So, once again, really love the most of the movie. And, yeah, so... I yeah. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching the recording, and I'll catch you next time.